Well, good evening. And welcome to this year's Noah Krieger Memorial Lecture and our very timely conversation on, <laughs> on public service in turbulent times with our very honored guest, Mr. Preet Bharara, who is currently a distinguished scholar at New York University School of Law and the former US attorney for the Southern District of New York. I'm Professor Susan Moffitt. I'm the director of the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs here at Brown University. I am delighted to see all of you here tonight. Um, welcome to our special guests. Um, and thank you all for joining us. So tonight's lecture is in honor of Noah Krieger who was an outstanding Brown University student who graduated from Brown in 1993. And to honor Noah's memory and his interest in public policy and economics and political science, the Krieger family has very generously supported a range of opportunities and programs at the Taubman Center. In addition to the annual Noah Krieger Lecture, which is where we're at tonight. Um, there is also a, an internship and a prize. All of these opportunities provide students at Brown with opportunities to engage in public service outside of the classroom. And I think as tonight's lecture helps make clear, it's a vital time for public service. This lecture is one of the most important events on Brown's calendar every year. Um, we are delighted and honored to have the Krieger family join us tonight, Sandy and Carol and Paul. Will you please all join me in welcoming and thanking the Krieger family. <laughs> this year, the Talman Center is focusing its programming on three themes, the cost of living, the value of democracy and the price of security. And uh, Mr. Barrara's work and career really embody and intersect these three themes. <clears throat> As we find ourselves learning more about uh, the charges and indictment arising from uh, Robert Mueller's investigation, we're very fortunate to have Mr. Barrara here with us tonight to help us make sense of what's going on in the world we live in. Mr. Barrara's career is indeed the embodiment of courageous public service, um, especially in these turbulent times. He served as US Attorney for the Southern District of New York between 2009 and 2017. And there he saw the investigation and litigation of a high volume of cases involving terrorism, narcotics and arms trafficking, financial and healthcare fraud, cybercrime, public corruption, gang violence, organized crime, and civil rights violations. He was, of course, very well known for his work fighting corruption and Wall Street crime. Among his many awards and honors, Time Magazine has listed him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Mr. Barrara is a graduate of Harvard College and Columbia Law School and he is presently a distinguished scholar in residence at New York University's Law School. We're honored to have you join us tonight. So moderating our conversation, and in a little while, Professor Corey Brettschneider will be joining us. Corey is a professor of political science who works at the intersection of constitutional law and democratic theory. He is the author of many influential articles and four books, and yet another, a fifth book that is coming out next year, The Oath and the Office, A Guide to the Constitution for Future Presidents. He is also <laughs> timely as well. He'll be joining us shortly. He's also a frequent contributor to publications such as Time Magazine, Politico, and The New York Times. So our time together is going to unfold in the following way. Mr. Uh, Preet Bharara will begin with about 20 to 30 minutes of comments on public service in these turbulent times. And then he will engage in conversation with Professor Brettschneider for about another 20 minutes. 
And then we'll open up the floor to your questions. We would ask that you uh, line up um, there. We are indeed a full house tonight, which is wonderful, but that invites us all to be mindful of our airtime. So when it is your turn to ask a question, please ask one direct question and then share the air with your colleagues. So now you please join me in very warmly welcoming Mr. Pri Perora. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for that introduction. Um, you know, it's interesting. I've spoken a number of times since I left office, and either out of some form of decorum or etiquette, which I fully appreciate, the person who introduces me never actually indicates how it is that I came to be in, in the private sector. <laughs> so, so for those of you, just by way of introduction, I was fired by the President of the United States. You may have read something about that. I'm doing fine. Um, everything, everything is all right. I'm a distinguished scholar in residence at um, NYU Law School, so that's great. Um, I, um, I, I have three plugs to make. Before I start, I was told it was okay to do that because you guys didn't pay any money to get in here, so. Uh, plug number one, um, uh, one of my former colleagues uh, who was the United States Attorney here for a period of time, when I was the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York, Peter Narona is here, who is running for a very important office in the state of Rhode Island, Attorney General of Rhode Island. So, you know, vote for him and stuff. <laughs> Do that. You're lucky. You're lucky to have a public servant like like Peter in Rhode Island. Um, second, I want to first just thank the Krieger family for inviting me um, and for giving me the opportunity to speak here and to honor the memory of Noah as well. Of course, the member of the Krieger family that I know the best is Paul Krieger, um, who used to work with me, um, who I promoted a number of times to various things, so you owe me a little bit for that. <laughs> he, he, has, um, he left the U.S. Attorney's Office recently uh, and is also now in private practice, not fired. He was on, it's on his own, so you don't have to put that on your resume. Um, he has started his own law firm, so if you, um, if you get in trouble <laughs> and, you, and you want counsel from New York or you slip and you fall, as they say, I better call Paul. So uh, I, hope you, I hope you do well in all, in all of the, your endeavors in, in private practice on your own. It's not an easy world out there anymore. And then the third uh, plug is for me. Uh, yeah, I'm a distinguished scholar at NYU, but I, I'm doing lots of other things. Um, sometimes people feel a little bit bad for me because I was fired and they don't know what I'm, what I'm up to. I did an interview shortly after uh, I left office with Hassan Minhaj on The Daily Show. I don't know if anybody saw it, but he did an entire back and forth interview with me, asking me, you know, feeling bad for me and kind of making fun of the fact that he, you know, thought I was unemployed. And he asked me questions along the lines of repeatedly, you know, what, pre, what is it like to eat um, expired yogurt out of a dumpster? <laughs> you know, it's not that bad. You, if, you, if, you, if, you have, if you have some gr granola that's fresh, it's, it's actually very nice. But in addition, so I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, I have this gig at NYU. I'm writing a book, um, and I have a podcast. It's, thank you. <laughs> Once I figured out what a podcast was, I said I should do that. Um, no makeup required. It's called Stay Tuned with Preet, and some of the things I'll talk about you can hear more of if you want to help me send my children to college, maybe Brown, which is very expensive. Um, <laughs> There are little ads that I have to read on, on the podcast, but you know we talk about issues of justice and fairness and some of the things that are going on in the world. You'll get a, a special preview of some of those things. Um, I understand there was news today. As I was, <clears throat> as I was getting out of my, my house this morning, I was telling Paul this. I ordered a car service whose name I won't mention, but it's one of those where you have an app. and it tells, So all these things are happening. Uh, Paul Manafort is charged, this other guy, um, uh, his, his protege, uh, Rick Gates, is charged. Another guy, George, not Stephanopoulos, Papadopoulos, <laughs> is charged. And, and my car comes, and I look at the app. And li this is literally true. A few hours ago, the driver of my car, his name was Stalin. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, should I get in the car? <laughs> should I, should I, what kind of a sign is it? I actually took a screen, because I won't show it to you, but you'll have to trust me. But I did send it to my wife. She's like, oh, my god. But I made it, I made it okay, Stalin is a very good driver, apparently. 
Um, I thought you couldn't be named that anymore. I don't know how that, I don't know how that works. <clears throat> um, so, I, so I know that um, what's on people's minds is the stuff that happened today, and I have, I have a few things to say about it. Maybe I'll talk about that a little bit at the end or in the Q&A, because I do have some reaction. And once again, if you listen to the special episode of Stay Tuned, which I recorded <laughs> from my living room this morning because I was going to be on a train most of the afternoon, you'll get a special preview of what I, of what I say there here. Um, public service has been the most important work that I've ever done in my life. Most of my adult life, I've been in public service in one form or another, mostly as a, as a federal prosecutor, first as a line prosecutor, then as the United States Attorney. And in between, I worked as a staffer in the U.S. Senate. And I, I think that any time in American life, public service is important and giving back to your country is important. I think it's especially <clears throat> an important obligation to people who have a lot of privilege. And I feel like I've had more privilege than most people because I wasn't born in this country. But to the extent there are times when public service is even more important than other times, I think that time is now. I think that uh, there's no time that I can think of, at least in my adult life, where people of conscience who care about their country and care about justice and care about fairness and care about the rule of law or care about simply helping people who are more disadvantaged than they are when, they're, when they've ever been more needed in America and around the world. And that form of public service, by the way, can take many forms. It can take the form of a job that you might have. It can take the form of volunteering in some capacity. It can take any, any kind of leadership, even if you're in the private sector, if that's what you choose to do when you leave college. Protest has never been more important, I think, in American life, going back in recent memory at least. Speaking out has never been more important, uh, whether you're talking about the travel ban or, frankly, you're talking about sexual harassment in the workplace, which is something that we have seen uh, action can be taken and minds can be changed simply by people talking about things that they weren't willing to talk about before. What I think really public service should be about in some form or another, and then I'll get to the, to the main topic of how I consider these issues, is ways we can make our American system better, ways we can make our institutions work better and live up to the ideals that they're supposed to stand for. Um, I worry sometimes, there's a particular kind of public service that I'm a fan of, as you might imagine given what I spent my career doing, and that's, and that's government service. And just, just one quick story about how I think of that, and then I want to talk about how I think our institutions are faring under this particular president. Um, and some of what I have to say is probably more optimistic than you might imagine, and some is pessimistic. Uh, before I get to that, I want to talk about how I think it is important for people, no matter what your political stripe is, um, how you view the world, to, to find ways, if you can, to serve in government. Charity work is great. Foundation work is great. Volunteering with all sorts of nonprofits is wonderful and exceptional. I think there is value and need for people who, who care about the country to think about government service. You know, I, I was the U.S. attorney when Donald Trump got elected. I assumed that I was going to lose my job then, and there were some people uh, it's not a political place. It's not supposed to be a political place. But there were some people, you know, who had a reaction to that election. And the question was asked, and it was asked the day after the election. It was asked, uh, you know, the day I got fired, and I gave a speech to the office, this the Monday after I got fired. And I said the same thing uh, in both of those circumstances. I said, you know, the, the massive work that goes on in a U.S. attorney's office, and this is true throughout government, not all of it, and certainly not at the higher levels where politics can intrude. But the rank and file folks, and particularly the entry level folks, it doesn't matter who the President of the United States is. And particularly in the US Attorney's Office, if you choose to do criminal work, your duty and, and allegiance is not to a particular person, even if that's been asked for. Your duty and allegiance is to the Constitution, and to the public, and to your oath of office. And, and the mass of what people do in you know, in terms of giving people housing or giving people a fair shake in court uh, or protecting the streets or making sure we're not uh, attacked in the homeland has no political aspect to it. Now, I, I used to say, and I still say, that I think there are three political parties or should be in the United States of America, Democrat, Republican, federal prosecutor. <laughs> <clears throat> Unclear, you know, how the federal prosecutor party is doing at the moment, um, but it's having something of a resurgence as of this morning. And, and I think that people who decide because they don't like 
and, and I get it, and I, we can talk about this more, and it depends on the area you're interested in, and it depends on the agency that you think you might want to work at or volunteer for, but if, if everyone of good faith and goodwill and good conscience who cares about the country says, I don't want to serve because I don't like this president, or I don't want to serve because I think I can't be a part of the team, which is millions of people strong in the federal government, then I think you'll lose something. There also, by the way, are all sorts of places to serve in, in state service, state government and city government. Go work for Peter. He's going to need some good people when he gets elected. Um, my only point would be, I don't want people to think that just because they don't like the person at the top, if that's true, and if you like the guy, you know, more power to you, uh, to write off government service. Uh, you, you need to have people who have a diversity of opinion and who believe in democracy and the rule of law in order for our, our country to function well, I think. So what I thought I'd talk about connecting the idea of service to what I think we need service to accomplish is how our institutions are doing, how democracy is doing, and I think the Taubman Center is the kind of place where it's good to have that kind of conversation. Um, so many people are trying to understand what's happening in the United States and what will happen in the United States. In particular, there's consternation uh, about what the rule of law means, if it means anything, in the age of Trump, whether the precedents, our precedents will be respected, whether norms will be followed, whether presidential power will be expanded uncontrollably, whether dissenting voices are at risk, and whether certain freedoms are in jeopardy. Ultimately, the question is how will America's aspirational system of checks and balances, and those are important, play out in the coming months and years? And these are serious questions, and I don't think they're hyperbolic. Um, two quick caveats at the beginning of talking about these issues. One, even though I'm standing here and I'm purportedly a distinguished scholar at a university, uh, I'm not an academic and I'm not a political scientist and I'm certainly not a predictor of the future. Um, these are just sort of back of the envelope thoughts as a recent government service, government servant, practitioner and observer of the main checking institutions in US democracy. Second caveat um, or point. Nothing I say here this evening is intended to be partisan or political in the, in the small term of that, the small sense of that phrase. Uh, in fact, I think every observation and concern falls largely within the mainstream of both Democratic and Republican worry in the United States right now. And if you don't believe me, talk to Bill Kristol, talk to David Frum, look at the Wall Street Journal editorial page, sometimes, not always. <laughs> see, see other noted conservatives and Republicans like Ben Wittes, Senator Bob Corker, Senator John McCain, Senator Ben Sass. There are lots of people who have a concern about what separation of powers means, have a concern about what rule of law means, have a concern about what decency means in high office. Um, I almost never, to make a point on any of these issues, cite to a liberal or a Democrat. I mean, some, I am friends with some of them, but there's meant to be a joke, I'm friends with many of them. Uh, because I think, I think we need to get beyond this idea, as, at least in, in a certain way, of who's a Democrat, who's a Republican. And for the purpose of this talk, I wanna talk about you know, the fundamental nature and fragility of, or durability of institutions that we all care about and that allow us to live you know, freely and fully in the United States of America. Now, so one reason for concern about what's happening with democracy in America is that our president, Donald Trump, does have a well-documented penchant for strong men. He has kind of authoritarian crushes, if you will. That's pretty clear from the record. He seems constitutionally drawn to them, constitutionally unable to criticize them. He rather goes out of his way to praise them. The greatest example brought into sharp relief once again today is, is Vladimir Putin, about whom he clearly can't say a bad word. Um, the other less known folk are uh, President Erdogan in Turkey, you know, people have been following some of the things that that gentleman has been doing. You know, I, have, I have a particular beef. There's a thing between me and President Erdogan. I know you think I'm kidding, but I'm not. Uh, we, we brought a case that's still pending, and I have no authority over the case anymore, against a, uh, a gold trader named Reza Zarab, who is an Iranian national and used to live in Turkey, and we arrested him in connection with a case for which conduct he was also had been arrested three years earlier in Turkey and it had gotten off because, among other things, it has been reported, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that President Erdogan basically fired all the prosecutors and judges 
who he thought were unfairly going after this gentleman, Reza Zarab. And in fact, some of those folks have been prosecuted. So there was a feeling in Turkey uh, among a large segment of the secular population that you know, corruption can't be squashed and justice can't be done. And then when we arrested Reza Zarab here in the United States, there was a lot of outpouring of appreciation for our system from rank and file folks in Turkey, but also a lot of anger from the government. I'll get back to that in a moment and tell you why it's relevant to, to my thoughts. But among other things, you know, President Erdogan has over time consolidated power, taken away freedom, jailed reporters, and you never hear Donald Trump say a bad word about that either. In fact, just a few weeks ago, you may recall, President Erdogan was visiting the United States of America, and he was in D.C., and in plain view of him, guards who were working for him beat up protesters. This was not on the streets of Istanbul. This was on the streets of Washington, D.C., and Donald Trump had nothing to say about it. Eventually, the Justice Department indicted in absentia, I think, some of those guards who were now unable to be brought to justice because they've left the country and they may have diplomatic immunity. But President Trump said nothing about this strong man doing these things in the streets of an American city, not just any American city, but our capital. But a guy like John McCain says, literally, he says, um, he said, quote, the Turkish ambassador should be thrown the hell out over the incident. And yet he gets, we get nothing from Donald Trump. Uh, President Erdogan has also, by the way, I don't mean to make this about, about me, but I'm at the podium. And he, he, he literally has accused me personally of being, of being helpful and fomenting uh, the coup, the failed coup in Turkey. I have not ever participated in any coup <laughs> that, I'm, uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, but he has accused me of doing that. I've actually never even been to Turkey. Then David Ignatius of the Washington Post reported just a couple of weeks ago that uh, President Erdogan had a meeting, and I knew about this meeting at the time, but it was only reported on recently, in September of 2016, had a meeting with Vice President Biden and said in the meeting, among other things, but spent a good amount of time, I was saying that, that A, the case against Reza Zarab should go away. So he thought he had the ability to tell the head of a, of a sovereign nation, not just any sovereign nation, but this sovereign nation, uh, how to handle their justice system, and then B, as a bonus, that I should be fired. Took a little while for that to happen. And I don't know. So, you know, Erdogan doesn't always get his way immediately. Um, but it's an astonishing thing that someone like Putin, someone like Erdogan, someone like Duterte, who is the, the leader in the Philippines, who is basically running an extrajudicial war uh, against drug crime, including bragging about and being uh, proud of extrajudicial pretrial killings of people who are mere suspects of drug crimes in the Philippines, and Donald Trump lauds that conduct. And I, look, I'm not naive, and I know people in this room are not naive, and throughout American history, we have to be mindful of strategic interests of the United States, and we are sometimes friends and allies with countries whose leaders are not wonderful in every particular way, but that's, I think, a little bit different from, a, from, a, from having a president going out of his way to laud and praise the particular strongman tactics and techniques that are undertaken by people in those countries. I think that words matter, signals matter, values matter. And so, I, the, in part, it's behavior like that that causes people to ask the question, you know, is it possible to do in a long time stable democracy like we have what Putin and Erdogan are doing in their countries? So the good news is I don't, I don't think so, at least not in the short term. And I want to talk about why I think that is true. Um, to my mind, some of the central questions of the day are these. What is the possibility of reining in an executive bent on weakening the other branches of government, intent on bending them to the will of the executive? Corollary to that, are institutions resilient? Can they hold their own? Can rule of law prevail? What does that even mean? What does that mean today, given how we're talking about it? You know, it is true. People want change. Um, that's why Obama got elected. That's also why Trump got elected. The question is what kind of change and how much? Do people want reform? Do they want radical reform? Do they want revolution? American democracy, by the way, is not conducive to revolution. 
though America itself was born of revolution. And that's because American democracy is fairly stable. And it is fairly stable in part because it is stable structurally. There are three co-equal branches of government and a pretty free press. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. But it's, all, it's also stable politically, by the way. Two dominant parties, and only two for as long as the mind can remember. And by the way, here's an, a point that I think we lose sight of given the kinds of rhetoric that people use. When politicians on occasion talk about revolution, they're using rhetoric pleasing to the ear of unhappy people, but they don't mean revolution, really. Let's talk about the institutions that uh, in an overlapping and, and interlocking way uh, check and balance each other. So first we have the, the press. So that's not a branch of the government, but the press is referred to in the Constitution, in that First Amendment, that people were wise enough to draft. There have been attacks on the press, and this gets people very upset. Steve Bannon, who uh, is no longer in the administration, um, says the media is the opposition party. Uh, Trump himself has suggested the press is the enemy of the people. He talks about fake media all the time. You know, the funny thing about that is, as you all know, uh, if there are good stories being written for a while, he likes them. If there are not good stories being written for a while, he doesn't like them. He's been negative about Fox News, even though recently he's been positive. He's been positive about the New York Times, even though recently he's been the other way around on it. And as much as people get bent out of shape, and they should, and I think attacks on the free press are not a great idea, even if they sometimes make good politics to a small portion of the population, and increasingly smaller, it seems, over time, the resilience of that institution, I think, is has been demonstrated. And part of the reason for that is structurally, the press remains fairly free. And even a president of the United States who has access to nuclear weapons is more powerless to do something to take away the free press. He can undermine the press. He can undermine people's confidence in the free press. Uh, he can attack reporters by name. Uh, he can tweet about them. But without much greater effort that I don't see happening any time in the near future, he can't undo the First Amendment. And he can't even undo some of the protections we have under the libel and slander laws that allow for, pre, for, the, for the, you know, the, the news gathering function. And in some regard, I think some of the attacks on the press have backfired. If you read uh, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and certain other publications, some people would argue, and those in the press sometimes argue this, <clears throat> there's been kind of a, a, a renaissance in accurate reporting depending on your perspective, but in investigative reporting. And I don't see any time in the immediate future that the press, even if they're sometimes called fake news, even if they're sometimes banished from the White House press room unfairly, uh, I don't see the press stopping doing its job. And that's something that is unique to this country. In President Erdogan's Turkey, he had not been pro-press, but then after the coup happened, the attempted coup, literally hundreds and thousands of journalists have been jailed. Literally, I mean, it's fine for Donald Trump to say every once in a while we should think about whether or not NBC should maintain its license. But as far as I can tell, that's an empty threat. <clears throat> that's demagoguery. That's a tweet that a lot of people reacted to. But I don't see the free press going anywhere anytime soon. So that remains, I think, a powerful checking function on concerns people have. Second, uh, now getting to the real branches of government, the courts. So the federal courts are you know, a powerful institution in this country and a separate co-equal branch of government. Now, on a personal level, just as with reporters, um, I, I have many friends who are judges, and I've talked to them. And some of them have said to me, look, we, we do our jobs, and maybe there are judges here, we do our jobs, and we're a little bit wary. A couple have said this. Uh, that, God forbid, we have a case that implicates uh, or has some connection with the president or the White House or one of his businesses uh, or one of his associates, and like the judge in California, the President of the United States decides to openly mock us or you know, mock me or intimidate me personally on Twitter. That's not great. I'm not gonna enjoy that. It's not gonna be good for my family. It's not gonna be good for my kids. It's not gonna be good for my neighbors. It's not gonna be good for my privacy. And you know, nobody wants, you know, people forget, you know, judges, you know, they wear robes and they sit elevated. You know, they're people too, most of them. Most of them are people too. And uh, I mean, almost all of them are. And, and they can be, uh, worried about that. But the other thing that they say is, and you can see this from actual decisions that are taking place, they're not actually going to be intimidated into not doing their job. The president can threaten, cajole, mock, intimidate, do all those things. But the judges have you know, the most valuable thing that you can have in this situation. They have life tenure. 
And you know, unless you're starting to talk about something really extraordinary in terms of a breach of, con of the Constitution, the President of the United States has nothing really to do with that. He can try to put other people on the bench that he likes better, but that takes a long time. And there's also nothing to suggest that he's being that dramatically different in the kinds of judges he's putting on the bench, even if you don't like them, than George W. Bush was, if you're on that side of the, of the aisle, or that uh, any other Republican nominee or president might have done. So the courts, I think, remain strong and resilient because of the tradition, but also because of the structure. You know, the, the founders, when I read the Federalist Papers, and maybe some of you are reading them now for the first time, they're extraordinary. And I didn't appreciate, when I was a government major in college, how extraordinary, but I'm seeing it now. Because some of those things, when you're putting interest against interest and, check, and checks against checks, they make a difference in times like this. So if you're a judge and you get intimidated by the president and get on the wrong side of the president, it doesn't matter, you have life tenure. If you're a U.S. attorney, then you get fired and you get a podcast. But if you're, <laughs> if you're a sitting federal district court, which is not bad, it's totally good. <laughs> but if you're a judge, you can stand strong. Um, the, the judiciary is tough to dominate. And you can also see by uh, some of the successive decisions in the travel ban cases, I think the judiciary remains strong. Other branch of government, the Congress. So I worked in the Congress. I worked in the Senate Judiciary Committee as a staff member for four and a half years. So I have, you know, I have mixed feelings about Congress, like a lot of people do. Um, the president, uh, on certain occasions, has attacked my former boss, Senator Schumer, uh, as a chief clown. Then he had a chummy dinner with him, the dinner with Chuck and Nancy, as you may have read about it. On some occasions, he has a good relationship with Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell, who are of his own party. And on other occasions, he's going to war with them. Steve Bannon has openly declared that he's going to war against those folks. But on powers of legislation, Again, for structural reasons, there are certain things the president can't do. The president can issue executive orders, and he's done some of that, but those can be combated in the courts, as we've seen with the travel ban uh, rulings. Uh, but many, many other things, including the overhaul of health care, if you want to do it, uh, or, or, uh, or tax reform, such as is, if you want to do it, that has to go through Congress. And I think Congress has been what it always is, uh, you know, sort of one, one finger in the air to see which way the wind is blowing, and depending on what the breakdown is between the two parties in either chamber of, of Congress, they will investigate more or less. They will stand up to the president more or less. And you're also seeing this, I, I sent a tweet the other day. You should follow me on Twitter, by the way. Um, I don't get paid for that, but you should follow me anyway. Uh, that you know, we need more retirements in Congress. Only when people are either retired, you should read this interview that John Boehner did. Um, it's pretty extraordinary, although there's a lot of expletives. So be, if you don't like that, don't read it. Um, only when, only when members of Congress, of both parties, are either planning to retire and they don't have to run again, or have retired and smoking Marlboros on the golf course like Boehner was, do they tend to speak anything like the truth, and in particular, say things that might be unpopular with the president of their own party. Um, but depending on what's going on institutionally and politically, Congress can be either weak or strong, but I don't think that's determined necessarily by you know, autocratic actions of the president that's often determined by the popularity of the president. And the current president is not particularly popular and my, by my rough, you know, back of the envelope math, it allows members of Congress, much like the courts, to stand up a little bit more. And so I'm not, I'm not so worried that the president of the United States is, again, don't get me wrong, on all of these points, there are things to be worried about, there are things to be upset about, there are things to be angry about, there are things to be outraged about. What I'm saying, the, the, sort of the premise that I'm answering is, you know, should we worry that we're, descend, we're, that we're descending into some autocratic state just because the president speaks in rhetoric that suggests, by the way, and this I think is true, if he had his druthers, would he take us there? Uh, and the answer to that question, I think, is very disturbing. If the president had his druthers, uh, you know, would he want judges to do what he wants them to do? If the president had his druthers, would he have less protection for the press? If he had his druthers, would he really take away licenses of certain newspapers like Erdogan has done and certain TV stations? I think he, I think he would. I think he might. And that we should be horrified by. But on the other side of the coin, he can't do those things. So I worry a little bit less. But the place where I, I'm most concerned, maybe because this is what my background is about, where <clears throat> uh, you know, some of the activities, conduct, rhetoric, attitude of the president gives me concern is not with the press, is not with the courts, it's not with the Congress, 
um, but it's within the executive branch itself. Because as I've been you know, trying to point out thematically, when there are structural protections for these other branches or for these other ways of, of talking and being and acting, there's little the president can do. But there's a whole other regime of, that governs and regulates conduct in the government. And those are called norms. And norms, by definition, are soft. And there are certain things that we have relied upon with respect to our presidents, particularly in the law enforcement function, as Peter and I and others know, um, that can be trampled if those norms are not observed, if those traditions are not observed. And they're not against the law. It may not be against the law to fire the FBI director, although we're going to see if that's true or not, ultimately. It may not be against the law to tell your attorney general not to file a charge against your ally in Arizona. It may not be against the law to tell your Justice Department, you know, figure out a way to lock her up. Um, but that takes us back to the days of where other countries went through banana republics, where particular presidents decide on a whim that they want certain people who are their allies protected and certain people who are their adversaries attacked and prosecuted. Th there are not actually laws against a lot of that conduct and behavior. The principle of, of, of prosecutorial independence which you know, I have devoted my professional life to, like Peter has and will again, uh, is not in the Constitution. It's not even something everyone understands, appreciates, or respects. It has been preserved over time by tradition, by devotion to principle, and by common sense. You know, the Justice Department is unlike the other departments in the cabinet, whether President Trump realizes it or not. It's not a policy-only institution. It has policy. And you have to think about what the policies on, that, that, that govern privacy should be and protecting the homeland should be and how to deal with um, foreign threats maybe should be and how much money should be spent on cybersecurity. Those are policy decisions. But on the issue that makes, one of the issues that makes this country special, that no one is above the law, that everyone is equal before the eyes of the law, no matter how much money you have, no matter how uh, powerful you are, no matter who you know uh, or where you've come from, that, that's enshrined in principle largely even though you have some constitutional protections. That's enshrined in tradition. That's enshrined in a pattern of conduct by people who have preceded us to make sure that no one gets special treatment, that the president, even though he is the head of the executive branch and all United States attorneys serve at his pleasure, we don't serve him. We never serve the president of the United States. And I think we have reason to worry about that. I think we have reason to worry based on a lot of facts that have come up. Forget about my firing and, and what that was about. Uh, but when you have evidence that the president decided to tell the FBI director after kicking out his attorney general and his son-in-law, I want you to lay off this person who is close to me, in the example I already gave, I gave with respect to Joe Arpaio, or the example of the president asking for personal loyalty from someone who's supposed to be independent, arm's length, upholder and enforcer of the law in law enforcement, that's worrisome when you have pre a pre pretextual memo created by our former colleague, Rod Rosenstein, who you know, I have respect for, but boy, I don't know what was going on in connection with the firing of Jim Comey there. When you have the president say in an interview to Lester Holt, and I don't know what's going to happen with the Mueller investigation, although we know some things today, it doesn't have to be the case that you uh, criticize something only when an indictment comes down. We know enough publicly already, at least I do, to be concerned about what norms are being violated. And the, the, the problem is, are there going to be people who are prepared to stand up to it? Now, this issue, then the question becomes, and I'll, I'll get to your questions in a minute, uh, what do you do about these soft norms that are being violated? Are there certain circumstances in which to protect against these violations and these encroachments, do you codify soft norms into hard laws? And it's a project that I'm going to be working on at NYU, I think, longer term and the Brennan Center to try to address. I mean, everyone loves to talk about what's happening today and what's happening with a particular indictment today, but my concern, and I hope the concern of other folks here and at the Taubman Center over the long term, is how, how should the country, how should Congress, how should the public, how should the press react to uh, the trampling of certain of these norms? Are they worth preserving? Are they worth uh, just talking about? Or are they worth doing something about more Specifically, and I'll give, you, I'll give you a couple examples. It's not just about what Donald Trump has done. You know, there has been a history in this country of presidents overreaching and being strong executives from time to time. And Congress 
strikes back. I'll give you my favorite example of a soft which, which you learned in, you know, in second grade probably. The first president of the United States, George Washington. He got, ele he got elected the first time, he got elected the second time. He could have gotten elected until the day he died, right? But what did George Washington do? He stepped down after two terms. The Constitution didn't require him to step down after two terms. There's no law preventing it, and his health, uh, if I remember my history books, was fine. And he said, I'm going to set a tradition and a precedent to step down. He created a norm that was a good norm for the country. He said, I didn't, we didn't establish this country for there to be a king who's nominally elected, and he could have been. And that tradition held true for like a century and a half, do the math correctly, almost two centuries. And then you get a very popular president by the name of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who lots of people like. Um, there's lots of monuments to that guy. Uh, he helped us defeat evil in the world, and we're a free country in part because of what Franklin D. Roosevelt did, Democrat, Democratic Congress. But he kept running and running and running. He got elected four times. And what did we do? We, we did the hardest thing it is, there is to do in this country, legally. We amended the Constitution to prevent another person, even as popular as Franklin Delano Roosevelt, from being able to serve three terms as president. That's an extraordinary thing. And it informs the question that I have you know, to end with. I'll give you another example, a smaller example. John Kennedy, popular president by a lot of accounts historically, named as his attorney general his brother. Bobby Kennedy, at th age 35, to head the Justice Department. By the way, a personal hero of mine. When I was in college, the same age as a lot of you folks here, I read Arthur Schlesinger's biography. It's like 43,000 pages long. But, <laughs> but you know, that was before the smartphone generation. I had some powers of concentration. Uh, and, and it's one of the reasons that I was set on this path to want to become, you know, in the, want to be someone in the Justice Department and care about justice and fairness and be a public servant. So. I think he was a good attorney general in a lot of ways, and civil rights issues he, he cared about and poverty issues he cared about. So you had a popular president, popular attorney general, uh, but even so, what did Congress do? They amended the statute, and they said you can't do that anymore, and they created anti-nepotism laws. So you have, you have examples of even popular people who have done things that maybe violated soft norms that smart people later said we shouldn't allow that. And in the context of that, I wonder, what are the kinds of things we should be thinking about with respect to this president, who does not have the same amount of popularity, certainly as George Washington? Um, and there are lots of other examples of this. Should we be codifying into law requirements that he can't fire a special counsel, even though that might have constitutional uh, concerns? Should we be codifying into law the requirement that everybody who runs for president on a, on a major party ticket have to dis disclose tax returns or must divest? I mean, one of my guests on the podcast said, I think it was Ben Wittes, who said, you know, uh, people forget in this country, a lot of the country at the top levels is run on an honor system. You know, it's not requirements, it's not statutes. And in particular, we give the president a lot of leeway. So the kinds of things that would have been illegal or would have gotten us fired if the United States Attorney did it, the president can do. And people are learning about that. And the question is, how should we as a country respond to those things? And I understand you know, the, the need and interest in going after Donald Trump specifically on particular things now and politically, but I think we should also be, particularly in an academic setting like this, think more broadly in connection with public service that you might be contemplating, what are, what are larger scale reforms that we should advocate for so that we don't have the next guy trying to do these same sorts of things? So, you know, I, I think these are major and immediate questions for the rule of law in the United States. And they're questions that go to the heart of what American democracy means, what it is, and what it will be. And um, let me close with, with the words of noted writer David Frum, who is not a liberal. Uh, he, in fact, he's a Republican, a neoconservative, former speechwriter for George W. Bush, also, I believe, uh, not a liberal. And I think, unless that's he paints, so I don't know if that changes things. <laughs> earlier, this, earlier this year, he wrote an article in The Atlantic entitled How to Build an Autocracy. And he said a lot of these things that I said, except more eloquently than I have said them. And it's about how Donald Trump could lead us down that path of autocracy. And he said, I think it's very smart what he said. Uh, and he said, quote, the United States is, of course, a very robust democracy. Yet no human contrivance is tamper-proof 
a constitutional democracy least of all. Some features of the American system hugely inhibit the abuse of office. For example, the separation of powers within the federal government, like we discussed, the division of responsibilities between the federal government and the states. Federal agencies pride themselves on their independence. The court system is huge, complex, and resistant to improper influence. But then he goes on to say, yet the American system is also perforated by vulnerabilities no less dangerous for being so familiar. Supreme among those vulnerabilities is reliance on the personal qualities of the man or woman who, ye who wields the awesome power of the presidency, close quote. I agree with that assessment. I think it's a logical assessment. And time will tell how vulnerable we are. So those are my thoughts. Thanks. Guys. So for now, about the next 20 minutes, uh, Professor Corey Brett Schneider uh, will lead us off in some questions uh, with Mr. Barrara, and then we'll open up the mics here. Uh, thank you, and thanks for being here. I'm Corey Brett Schneider. Um, I had a series of uh, outrageous hypotheticals that at any other point in history would have been the kind of thing that an abstract law professor asked, but today it looks like some of them might actually be happening. So I want to talk about the events of the day. But I, I want to start by following up on your terrific lecture uh, and ask about some of the vulnerabilities and some specifics about the possible reforms that we might have. So one worry is that we might be in a situation where we repeat or in a position to repeat something like the Saturday Night Massacre during the Nixon administration, where um, the current structure of our law allows uh, the president to fire an attorney general who refuses to fire a special prosecutor. And one worry is that despite the protections and norms that you've talked about, but that Trump has mechanisms within his own uh, power to hire and fire to uh, go after this investigation. So I guess my first question is, do you see any specific reason to reform the system as a whole the way that we did after Watergate with something like an independent prosecutor law and then something that might be closer to home, I mean, do you think that um, U.S. attorneys should have a kind of protection uh, in law from being fired, for instance, for political reasons? I mean, what kind of specific, would you want to see those kind of post-Watergate reforms uh, going yeah. forward? I, look, I think some reforms probably you want to see. Um, I'm going to be part of this task force at the Brennan Center, so I'll get back to you in about 12 months on, on particulars. Look, the, the, on the other side of the coin, what I'm doing is I'm raising the issue because we have to be concerned about the way in which I think this president thinks he can operate. I'm not saying necessarily, depending on the issue, that the way to solve that is to enact a law hamstringing a particular president uh, or taking authority away. You want a strong presidency in a lot of ways. Now, the independent we, we had an independent council statute, and nobody seemed to like it at a particular point in time. And it depends on what's going on in those circumstances. You can, you can have you know, um, an out of control, outrageous attorney general. You can have, we had an out of control, outrageous FBI director for whom the building is still named. I, you know, right? I mean, I don't think, and, 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 and part of the reaction, you know, we're talking about the reactions to presidencies, like the examples I mentioned, but the reaction to some of those excesses, both Watergate and, and the Hoover era um, abuses was, you know, all sorts of reform and, and that required not only le legally what, one example, what prosecutors would have to do and investigators would have to do to wiretap you know, a, an American's phone, but also all sorts of guidelines within the Department of Justice. People don't realize how hard it is, actually, don't tell the bad guys, but how hard it is to get up on someone's phone. And that is a product of the abuses that happened before. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need some of those things, but there's also an argument to be made if everyone is acting in good faith and everyone has the interests of the country in mind and cares about democracy and rule of law and fairness, sometimes the authority of the president to act unilaterally in that way protects us. Sometimes it doesn't. So I don't know where the balance ultimately lies, which is maybe an unsatisfactory answer, but I would like everyone to be thinking about it and to be talking about it. And one of the things we're gonna do 
with this project is to see on a bipartisan basis what kinds of proposals make sense and what don't. I'm going to ask you one of those hypotheticals that might have seemed outrageous uh, a year ago, but now I think is a real possibility. And it concerns another, apart from the hiring and firing ability, another power of the president, which has the risk of the kind of fragility that you were talking about. Are you going to ask about nuclear war? Uh, no, <laughs> although that is... We should <laughs> talk about That's out of my field yeah. of expertise, but we should talk about it. Yeah, um, but it, it is related. I mean, there are certain what look like they're close to absolute powers of the president, and one of them, aside from the commander-in-chief power, is the uh, power to pardon. So imagine that you're, I mean, here's the hypothetical, that you're, um, uh, you're uh, uh, in uh, Mueller's position now, that you are the special uh, counsel, and Trump does, uh, and you have the evidence, imagine, to go forward with an indictment, uh, and Trump pardons himself. I mean, what do you do in that circumstance? Do you still seek the indictment? Do you try to challenge the idea of a self-pardon? Uh, and uh, relatedly... I mean, yeah, I would do all of those things. I don't know how successful you'll be. Um, I mean, if your question is, do we amend the Constitution to take away the pardon? I, I bet some people would say we should. And look, it's like any other reform. It, you know, sometimes reforms are tied to the particular abuse that's going on at that time. And you may not propose a particular reform because it does too much, but you know, often politics and legislation is not only a matter of compromise, but also choosing among the lesser of two evils. So I'll give you another example that's, that's completely different. Um, you know, we did a lot of public corruption prosecution. I understand there's been corruption from time to time in Rhode Island. <laughs> I'm told. Uh, and and a, lot of, a lot of politicians we, we put away in New York. Um, and the question always gets asked to me, it's a, it's a parallel question, you know, should we have term limits? So, you know, lately, my view is, yeah, maybe, because these guys stick around too long, and when people stick around too long, a combination of sticking around too long and a concentration of power combined with a lack of transparency tends to lead to a culture where more corruption takes place, and I, I believe that. On the other hand, and this is, again, unsatisfying, on the other, in, in an ideal world where there was lots of turnover, natural turnover, you know, uh, anyway, and it would be better if you didn't have to enforce it. And there, were nat there, was, there was less natural power of an incumbent to retain his or her office. And we had a statistic that I used to cite all the time when I talked about corruption in New York. I don't know if it's still true, but for a long time, it was, the, the following was true. That if you were a New York State Senator, you had a greater likelihood of being removed, by office, being removed from office by indictment than by defeat at the ballot box. <laughs> and in circumstances like that, it's worth what you lose in terms of... Um, you know, continuity and longevity and expertise on the part of good faith public servants who do their jobs for decades, it may be worth it in that context. You know, they pass term limits in, I'm going very far afield now, I'm sorry. Uh, we pass term limits, we're gonna talk about what I wanna talk about. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, they pass term limits in the New York City, city camp, but it's, but it's a related point. And you lose something with that. In the same way, look, the pardon power was put in place presumably because there are moments for a president to show grace and mercy. You know, mercy and grace are not things we think about them. I know, Peter, and I, with, you think about them because these are human jobs you have that involve punishment of other people. But mistakes get made. And sometimes people deserve, after a life of, do, of doing good things, maybe the pardon is appropriate. And there's no other mechanism. I don't think you want to give that power uh, you know, to an assistant United States attorney. If you're going to have it, the sort of ultimate power of grace and forgiveness, in a sense, and wiping the slate clean in appropriate cases, it actually can be a wonderful thing. You know, the President Obama, at the end of his term, at the end of the term, but in the second term, more in the second term than the first, established this procedure that we all started following. But, you know, you had to go through various hoops, and people could make applications for either having their sentences commuted or for full out pardons. And we assigned them, uh, you know, to smart assistant U.S. attorneys in our office, and we would have meetings about them, and they were, it was wonderful to see who was deserving, who was not. It actually got you to think about what justice means. You know, it, they were, it was not about whether you met, met the, the requirements of a statute and people had been convicted years ago, but you got to think about what was just about continuing to have them under the yoke of this conviction, and, you know, in a percentage of the cases, we, we said, the prosecutors, the big bad prosecutors, 
made a determination that we would advocate on behalf of the commutation. And I see Peter nodding the same thing. That's a wonderful thing. It's a power that can be used really well. So to take it away, because it's been abused dramatically, may be worthwhile, but you lose something too. If I heard you right in the beginning, you thought a self-pardon might be a step too far that you would... Yeah, I would uh, be against yeah, a self-pardon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I would be opposed to that. It brings up the issue that I'm sure is on many people's minds, or at least it leads us into. I was hoping that you could give us a sense of the indictments today, what you think they might, if anything, lead to in the future, what evidence has come out, for instance, um, in, in these two cases. Uh, and also, I mean, relatedly, whether you think the president um, might have the ability, given the, some of the powers that we've been talking about, to fend off the investigation in a way that would be uh, worrying to many of us. So, so, so that's the big worry. Um, I think uh, there was a time when I thought, you know, there, there are, there's a hierarchy of norms and some things, well, yeah, you know, maybe we'll flout those. Um, but these certain things you would never do. I, I, was, I was stunned when he fired the FBI director for a lot of reasons. And I know not everyone loves Jim Comey and people have different views about the things he did in the last year, but I really thought that that couldn't happen. Um, you know, recently it's been reported on a lesser level that he's been personally interviewing some of the candidates to be the United States Attorney for my old office in the Brooklyn U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, not interviewing all of them, but, the, but only the ones that appears uh, who might run offices that are in a position to investigate uh, you know, his interests and his businesses because property and businesses are located in those districts. You, I, I kind of fell on the floor when I found that out. You would think that given everything else that had happened and all the grief that you, that you suffered from this, even Steve Bannon says, not as a moral, legal you know, matter, that the firing of Jim Comey was the worst thing ever. He says a, it was the worst political mistake, I think he said, since the, you know, the beginning of time. And yet, and yet, and yet I think so what the point I was making before is that Donald Trump had his druthers. I think he'd get rid of Sessions. I think he'd get rid of Mueller. I think, he would, I, th I think he's capable of doing lots and lots of things that I worry about. And I, and I worry that he might figure out a way to get rid of Mueller. I, I, don't, I, I think it's below 50%, but it shouldn't be above 0%. That should alarm people. Um, or pardon. So there's, there's various ways to subvert the investigation which concern me. Now, your question about you know, what do I think the, the charges mean? So I only had a chance to look at them you know, fairly quickly today. Uh, the first news you heard was that Paul Manafort and this guy Rick Gates were charged um, for conduct that happened before, mostly that happened before the campaign. And that's what everyone was talking about. And if you turn on the television, everyone was talking about Paul Manafort because he's a significant person. He ran the president's campaign. He didn't run it for the whole time, but he also oversaw the convention. He also was responsible, I understand it, for drafting and approving the final platform of the Republican Party. He's the one who said that Trump should pick Mike Pence. So he's, it's a big deal. And for a guy like that to have been, and his, you know, his uh, entanglements with Russian business and Russian power was known before he became the head of the campaign. It's not a small thing for someone like it. it separate and apart from legal jeopardy to him, I think you can infer some things about the judgment of a president who picks someone like that, particularly with everything else going around. But I thought that the more important news which took another hour or two to break, was the news that uh, not only had uh, Bob Mueller's special counsel's office charged another guy, George Papadopoulos, but also secured a guilty verdict from him. And people who you know read these things and, uh, and appreciate that he was arrested, I think in July, but he didn't plead guilty until October and all of that remained secret. And the last paragraph of the stipulated facts, I think, um, indicates that George Papadopoulos met and provided information to prosecutors on multiple occasions. That has all the hallmarks of having uh, flipped the guy, which means that they've converted him to the government side and that he's providing information. It may also suggest, given the secrecy surrounding his arrest and his guilty plea, that he might have been what we call a proactive cooperator for a period of time. And before we all knew about it, um, that not only is he in a position to testify in the future about things that happened in the past, the prosecutors would have to corroborate, but also that maybe he made some phone calls that were recorded. Maybe he, um, he got people to do things that were uh, incriminating to them in real time on an ongoing basis. And we're not gonna hear about those things for a while. So I think it means A, all of this together means A, that the Mueller team is very aggressive 
um, that they're moving you know, quicker than you might otherwise think, given that these things are complicated and the evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt in the highest profile matter that the country has seen in a long time, where everyone is going to be looking to make sure that every T is dotted and every I is, T is dotted? No, the T's are crossed. <laughs> I'm an immigrant. You know, I haven't been here that long. Uh, all the T's are crossed and I's dotted. Um, it's pretty fast. The second point is, I think, the fact that you have a cooperator uh, suggests that there'll be further charges later, or they hope there'll be further charges later. And third, the particular thing that the cooperator was charged with at least indicates one thing. And I don't mean to overstate it, I also don't mean to understate it. Uh, and that is the special counsel team, they take very seriously this idea of lying to investigators, which is, another, which is a form of obstruction. And the idea that these folks feel very strongly, whether or not there's an underlying crime, that you can't lie about your contacts with Russians when you're trying to investigate that very circumstance, that you're going to get charged, and we're going to try to send you to jail. So the fact that they care a lot about this issue of obstruction, given the other things we know are being looked at, should worry people that you may have heard of. <laughs> I'm. Uh very sympathetic to what you said in the lecture and what you've been saying now, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't try to push back a little bit uh, on behalf of um, uh, the Wall Street Journal and um, the president himself. So, I mean, what, what's the response to the claim that, I'm, that the Wall Street Journal did make and that I imagine we might hear from the president in the future uh, that um, this investigation is tainted uh, because of the conflicts uh, that uh, Mr. Mueller has had with uh, the FBI and I don't uh, understand what that conflict is. Know. What's the, you know? I mean, I don't get that. I mean, their argument okay. anyway is Bob Mueller. You know, you know, no human being is perfect, um, and we shouldn't put people on pedestals or on altars or whatever other religious raised item you might think of. Uh, but you know, as far as having bipartisan support and a reputation for neutrality, he's as good as it gets. This is a guy who not only you know, was he a heroic Marine and won uh, awards for bravery and valor, put that aside, but the guy was the uh, FBI director for 10 years. And at the end of 10 years, when his term was over, and that's a long time, 10 years, uh, rather than try to find another person, male or female, to replace him, Congress that does nothing, that does not, I mean, right? That, that can't agree on anything, pass legislation specifically for this guy to serve another two years, because like, wait, we can't, out of a country of 350 million people, we can't find someone better than this. And that was done by Democrats and Republicans. And, and so, you know, forgive me for being cynical in reacting to the Wall Street Journal editorial page and others who now all of a sudden are saying, I don't know about this guy. Like Newt Gingrich, one of my favorite tweets of all time from, from Newt Gingrich. Because, because, because it, it, was, it, was, it presaged tremendous hypocrisy. Uh, even Newt Gingrich couldn't help himself on the day that Bob Mueller was appointed. And by the way, Bob Mueller is not some you know, anonymous uh, person living in a forest that came out um, of a tree, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, I don't know, people say he's a good guy. Like, so he tweeted, uh, and I think he meant it. At the time, it was said that Bob Mueller is great, professional, bipartisan, you know, nonpartisan, great reputation. Everyone should calm down and let him do his work. That was in May. And within weeks, because it became politically expedient, when it looks like Bob Mueller is actually going to do his job, that same fella, Newt, decides, <laughs> decides to say terrible things about Bob Mueller. And what, has, what had changed? Like, I don't think anything. So, you know, I, everyone should always be skeptical of everyone. But I think that the origin of some of this complaining has to do with politics. I've got one last uh, big question before we open it up uh, uh, for questions from the audience um, about the theme of the lecture. And I'm going to stop now defending Donald Trump and, and switch to the, the view time. that I really am. Uh, and um, just to ask this, um, because you raised it, and I think it does connect to the theme. There are elements of the presidency which, as you say, quite rightly in the lecture, are governed by norms, and we have a history of presidents abiding by them. Uh, and so the vulnerabilities in the system, the bugs, uh, the fragility, as you call them, often haven't arisen. Uh, but when you have a president who disregards the norms, we see them very clearly. So I'll ask about the big one that you raised, but which I do want to have 
you follow up. Uh, Nixon uh, reportedly in uh, Kissinger's uh, uh, autobiography would talk about nuclear war. Uh, he mused about nuclear war uh, during a discussion with Alan Cranston, uh, senator at the time. Uh, and there was a worry that this was somebody who was unstable, that uh, had the complete power to, without any, any constitutional check, uh, to launch a nuclear weapon. Now, you've raised that again about Donald Trump. Is that an area where, when it comes to reform, we should be thinking about limiting the power of the president? You know, look, that's not an, an area of expertise other than, like, I don't want to die. Um, it's no small thing. In like a, <laughs> <laughs> and a burst of vapor from something sent by North Korea. Um, it's not a satisfactory. You know, you lose something on both sides. Like there, there's uh, presumably there's an intelligent and wise reason why you need to give the, a president the flexibility to be able to to launch, if necessary, any kind of strike within seconds or minutes. Um, as much as I don't trust Donald Trump. Um, on all of these matters, I don't know that the country would be better served in the future once you, you don't have a guy like Donald Trump to throw this to a committee in the Congress. I mean, I might, I might off myself before, <laughs> you know, they convened just because just there are better ways to go. <laughs> um, so, so I, you know... The solution to some of these things, by the way, and again, this doesn't solve the problem, is to have a better person than that get elected, <laughs> you know? Well, uh, I thank you. I think we can all thank you for a great conversation, a dark end. <laughs> thank you. And we're gonna open it up now for questions. We have some time for some questions. Start by introducing yourselves, please, when you, when you ask your question. Hi, uh, my name is Alec. Uh, thank you for coming today. I love the podcast, by the way. Um, I have thank a question you. about uh, a recent news event, the uh, somewhat of the disclosure of the JFK files, and I just wanted you to maybe talk for a minute about balancing the interests of the public's right to know with the president's power to kind of manage the records, as well as the uh, FBI and CIA's uh, apparent need to keep things uh, deeply secret after after 55 or, or so years. Look, I, I don't know the details of the particular decisions in that case. I think it's an age-old. Uh, tension between keeping things secret for legitimate purposes uh, to hide sources and methods, but also have the public be able to know. It doesn't seem to be to be unreasonable that when decades have elapsed, that uh, you err on the side of disclosure. I mean, we we had this debate um, in a slightly different context on 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 uh, upon what showing could very very old grand jury minutes be disclosed. Uh, so that the public could have some sense of the historical record. And there, there are famous cases of historical value where, you know, after 25 years, and I forgot what the ultimate rule ended up becoming, but there was a, there was a very robust debate in good faith on all sides where, you know, people thought that grand jury secrecy was such that no matter how much time passed, if people thought one day my grand jury testimony for historical reasons might become available, even 25 years or 30 years later, that might cause them not to give true and accurate testimony in the grand jury. So, so there are, it's a slightly different context, but the, it's the one that I know a little bit more about. So I appreciate that. I, my, I tend to think, and I thought this, even when I was in government, not just because I'm out of government, I think the government tends to overclassify and make things overly secret, um, not necessarily out of bad faith, but because it's just easier. And nobody wants to be on the hook for uh, allowing something to be disclosed, and then God forbid, even if it's a very, very remote possibility, there are people who don't want to be responsible for that. And you know, we, over, we, we classify too much, and it becomes difficult to undo it. But uh, my, again, without the specifics, I would err on the side of disclosure. Our next. 
Hi, my name is Brady. Thanks for your service, and um, I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room that would like to see you back in government as soon as possible uh, in the future. I think we need you. <clears throat> um, I'm I keep sending my resume back to Trump, and he's like, no, <laughs> we've yeah. been through this. Give Mueller a couple of years. Um, my question, what I'd like your thoughts on is the extent to which you think counterintelligence equities around sources and methods could and or should contravene the public's interests and the interests like in having justice served around bringing criminal charges around conspiracy with I think what can objectively be described as a hostile foreign power. So again, this, all these questions are like, well, there's this, we have this tension between which we get to liberty and, and security. Um, I understand the equities that the, that the intel agencies uh, espouse. Um, I, I think, because I came from, you know, mostly from criminal justice and believe that we can do justice in courtrooms, and we did a lot of terrorism cases and a lot of espionage cases, not as many espionage, but more terrorism cases. This was an ongoing battle between us, and you know, you pick the intelligence agency, including the central intelligence agency. My experience was um, that over time, uh, Take a step back. Part of the problem is every everyone. I don't mean to be over, overly philosophical about this, but uh, you know, people who have a who are, who are in a particular institution that has a particular tradition, they sometimes overemphasize the equity that they think is most important. So, um, and it's probably true of me also. So, if you're in an intelligence agency, it is drummed into you over and over and over again: secrecy, 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 secrecy. I'm not saying they're bad people. But, they, but they, are, they are primed and sensitive to the idea of any source method. And some of them are ludicrous. I'm trying to think of one. I can't remember if this thing is declassified or not, so I won't say it. <laughs> but some of these methods are absurd, we would find, that we wanted to have declassed so we could use, we could have testimony about this thing that, that led us to the bad guy to use in court. But their mindset was, we can't let anybody know, even if it's a very basic, obvious way to go about getting information on the internet. Um, and I get that. What I found, though, is uh, over time, and it took us time to do, to do these terrorism cases, uh, you have to develop trust with the other side. And you have to be in a position to compromise. So when we were dealing with intel agencies, and this is going back to the late 90s, and I didn't come until 2009, so a lot of this work had already happened, if you could make an intelligence agent understand, we are not trying to screw up your whole program, but there's also, an understand from our perspective, there's an interest to having closure, there's an interest to holding people accountable, because your intel officers, I'll tell you, on this basis, and again, I don't mean to cast any aspersions, uh, who would rather not hold someone accountable, who'd rather not make the case, because they were so concerned about protecting a source or a method or something else. Now, sometimes that makes sense. Obviously, if you have a high value asset who literally sees Vladimir Putin every day, I'm not saying there's such a person, but boy, if there was, um, you know, to be able to prosecute a food stamp case against someone, the equities are obvious. We had lots of cases when they were, when they were closer uh, than that, and you have to come up with, with ways to protect the sources and methods. And over time, when people saw that their, I think, um, overemphasis on protection and on secrecy, you know, the sky did not fall when we, uh, you know, moderated a little bit. That gets them, you know, it's a long-winded way of saying you got to work through it, and I get why people are that way, but it takes time. Thanks. Hi. Uh, my name is Demos. Um, you talked a lot about the strength of our systems, and I I'm a native of Albany, New York, so I was wondering, you know... I like that you were asking about the strength of institutions named Demos. Yes. I like that. Um, with the, the strength of our systems in mind, you know, I mean, you were involved with the corruption case, Dean Skelos and all that, which, you know, was then overturned. So do you see that as a failure of the system? And, and if so, or even more broadly, what do we do when the system fails? <laughs> but the system is the system, right? The, that overturning happened not at some mid-level. People are not, not aware. There was a case that was decided by the Supreme Court called McDonnell, and it's about the former governor of Virginia. And the Supreme Court decided, I think, and not, it was not a good decision. Um, a lot of people think it was not a good decision. Some people think it was. Uh, 
because the concern was unfettered discretion on the part of prosecutors and was less a concern about unfettered ability to engage in corruption on the part of elected officials. But, you know, when the system, yeah, I think the system may have failed in the larger sense, but, you know, we're a constitutional democracy. No norm was violated. Like, I don't, that kind of thing doesn't bother me as much as some of these other things we're talking about. You know, sometimes nine people see things differently from how you see them. And then you have to figure out other ways to protect the public from graft and corruption. Um, the good news in, the, in those two cases, uh, the courts decided that both in, in the case we brought against the head of the New York State Assembly and the head of the New York State Senate, one a Democrat, one a Republican, that this, this case that was decided, McDonnell case, after the verdicts had been rendered in, in my two cases, there was overwhelming evidence to prove their guilt. But because the Supreme Court narrowed the definition of what the quo is in a quid pro quo, so you give money to do a thing, what is official action that was given in return for the money, it can't be as expansive as it was before. We have to retry the cases. I have every confidence that we're gonna be able to convict. Um, but look, so, you know, we, we subject ourselves to law, uh, either by the Congress or by the Supreme Court. And if they decide that this is a thing that they think should be limited on, under that you know, limiting principle, then you have to abide by it. And I don't, I, don't consider, I don't consider it necessarily to be a failure of the system in the same way that some other things are, Although, even though I'm disappointed by it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Aaron Weinstein. Um, I did my PhD here like two years ago, and I'm teaching a class on the presidency right now. Um, my question, um, and I actually think you may have been at the hearings, um, or the testimony was when Jeff Sessions testified about his relationship with Trump and the kind of conversation they may or may not have had. He kept invoking executive privilege, but Trump hasn't invoked executive privilege and Sessions is saying, well, I'm holding off just in case he wants to. So I was wondering if you can come on, comment A on what you think about that tactic and then B, where you think we go from here. Will Sessions at some point be forced um, to either have Trump declare executive privilege and if he doesn't, then actually be forced to answer those questions. So I wasn't at that hearing. Uh, I was at the hearing where Jim Comey testified next to a woman who was wearing a T-shirt that she then had to cover because it was getting too much attention that said, Comey's homies. <laughs> <laughs> all these people were looking over. I thought they were all looking at me. They were looking at, they were looking at Comey's homies. Um, so, so this question of executive privilege uh, is, a, is a complicated one. And, it, and it's invoked either slyly uh, or, in, or implied or full out asserted in court by every administration that has ever existed because nobody likes to be told what they have to give up. And what I viewed, my personal view of what Jeff Sessions was doing was being you know, mildly clever, which is in that context, as you know, you know a, a Senate hearing is not a court of law where there's, there's, no, there's no independent third party neutral judge who can enforce the responsiveness of the, of the witness. And if you don't answer the question, you know, put you in court and then litigate the issues right then and there, it's, there's a lot of showmanship to it. And so his suggestion that there might be executive privilege, I mean, he could have said, look, I don't, you know, I, you, know you, you didn't ask me the question in iambic pentameter, so I'm not gonna answer it. I don't believe that's a privilege. But he could have said that and it didn't matter because they had no ability to force him to answer questions. Now, if you continue to refuse to answer questions on the basis that they weren't asked in a form consistent with iambic pentameter, I suppose, <laughs> then, then Congress has to take some action to cause the issue to ripen so you can argue about it in court. So if, if, if the committee said, uh, we need you to answer the question X, and Sessions said, I'm not gonna answer it, and he suggests it's because of executive privilege, they could issue a subpoena, I suppose, for documents relating to that, and then Sessions could say, I'm not gonna do it, and then you have to, and that's happened from time to happen in, a, in, in connection with an investigation that I helped to run when I was in the Senate involving the firing of United States attorneys. So how ironic is that, by the way? <laughs> um, and, and it happened, and it happened recently in, you know, in connection with the Fast and Furious investigation relating to Eric Holder. But, but as a term of art, this idea of invoking executive privilege only, I think, really matters if the parties decide to take it into a courtroom in the District of Columbia. Otherwise, it's just sort of random talk. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, do you think that if we want to have a fairer and more sensible democracy, democracy, we should 
get rid of the electoral college system and use the popular vote to elect our presidents? I'm just going to ask you, how long ago did you get your PhD? <laughs> Unfortunately, the, not yet. Well, you should have one, because, yeah, I think the electoral college seems very silly. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't have the same, uh, you know, view that you will lose a lot. And I understand the point of view that small states, large states issues. Uh, and I understand and, and believe in mostly this idea of how we have representation in the House of Representatives, right? And how we have representation in the Senate. But the idea that we consistently, not consistently, but multiple times now in recent memory, have elected someone who didn't get the most votes under, undermines people's confidence in their president, undermines people's confidence in the institution of elections. And there's so much other stuff um, that causes people not to like the person who gets elected that why should we begin? I mean, I think it's not good for any president uh, to have to worry that a lot of people think that that president is not legitimate. Why not have it be simpler, as you describe? So yeah, I'm in favor of that. <laughs> Okay, enjoy what is gonna be your only softball question today, apparently. Um, I'm a huge fan of Billions. I'm Prelot Brown, and I am an art student at RISD. You know, Billions is a very, is, fic is fictional. Oh, I know. Um, so you have a book coming out, and you have this TV show that is based, albeit extremely loosely, on your life. So were there any logistical issues there? Do you ever run into any, in general, regarding intellectual property or life rights? I didn't see it going that direction. <laughs> I know we're going to go, like, that's nice. You put like a substantive gloss Might on that. Might have a lawyer there, a future lawyer to defend. Yes. Um, uh, I, I have no intellectual property issue in that show um, because it's, it's about a United States attorney. It's not based on me. I don't recognize uh, anything <laughs> about the character. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a quick story. Not as a dominant it, Well, I was going to get to so, so, so if you, if you listen to the podcast, I believe it's episode four, where I answer this question, and I'll just briefly, so, um, so my parents got very excited when I told them that there was gonna be this show on Showtime called Billions, and it was gonna depict the United States Attorney, and there's gonna be like another bad guy, and I had dinner with the producers, and I met with Paul Giamatti, uh, and they were excited because most TV shows and depictions of, of Law and Order are usually the district attorney and not the United States attorney because apparently we're more boring. And so I told them they're very excited. They're like very proud Indian American parents. So they told all their friends and um, it was very exciting. That, you know, the show was gonna start on a, a couple years ago on a particular Sunday night. Um, and the United States attorney, as I mentioned, was gonna be played by, by noted Indian American actor, Paul Giamatti. <laughs> and my parents are very, he very, he who had a long and illustrious Bollywood career before before he did that dumb movie with the wine. <laughs> and, um, and uh, but I still, I don't drink Merlot for that reason. And he, uh, and so my parents were excited. They told all their friends, who are largely also uh, conservative, wholesome Indian American families in the country. And if you have, how many people have seen the show? All right, for those of you who haven't seen the show, the opening scene of the, of, of the United States Attorney begins with Paul Giamatti uh, on his back, on the floor, uh, without a shirt on, uh, tied up, his, his hands are tied, and you see enter the frame a, um, a bare, a, a female leg, uh, wearing a stiletto heel, <laughs> and steps on, this is, is your, it's, I don't know what S&M stands for, but apparently this is what that is, <laughs> and, and puts a, and puts a, I'm sorry for the young person who is here, uh, <laughs> but at least you have your PhD. This is better than a PhD. Uh, and, and the stiletto heel is placed on Paul Giamatti's bare chest, and the woman is smoking a cigarette, and then she puts out the cigarette on, yeah. <laughs> I had the same reaction. And puts out the cigarette on Paul Giamatti's chest, and he screams in pain. I'm sorry, I have to tell you the story. And then, <laughs> and then to relieve his pain, she, 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 she straddles him and engages in a bodily function. My parents have never mentioned the show again. It's like, they have no idea that show exists. 
I, it's I, a highly, I, highly fictionalized <laughs> show. <laughs> no intellectual property issues there. I, I think we have time for one more question. My name's Don Beyer. Um, well, um, you know, so there's a widespread perception that there's law exists in two places in this society. One for the, one law for the one percent or better off, an, another law or a different way of approaching for people who are less well off. And this, I mean, I don't think this is a new problem in, in the history of the world or anything. I, but I think it's a per, persisting problem. And I, I just sort of like to get your thoughts about that. How, what, what somebody in your position or in, in a public prosecutor's position, how they can operate to reassure people that, you know, that, or to convince people that that's not really what's gonna happen. Yeah, it's hard to do. And the way you do it, and I fear this is being undermined in, in various ways now, is um, you speak about it, uh, you make clear in the cases you bring that it doesn't matter how big you are, how important you are, how powerful you are, if you've broken the law, the system applies to you. And we tried to do it in big, we couldn't do it in every case, but we tried to do it in all the cases we brought. You know, you, you have to be fearless. We also brought cases on the other, so you have to go after folks who have broken the law, even if they're powerful, rich, and they can afford, you know, amazing defense counsel, and you can't be afraid of going, because there, there are soft ways in which they get away with things. It's not always because they've perverted the system, but sometimes, you know, people get intimidated by folks who have a lot of money and they have a, the better defense. And we prided ourselves, at least in our office, at saying we, we really don't care. We're not afraid of anybody, and we'll bring a case against anybody. Um, and on the other side of the coin, you have to show that no matter who the victims are, that they're not forgotten and they're important. And we couldn't do that in every case either, and there are some tragic cases that I know people are frustrated by, especially in the interactions between law enforcement and members of communities. But I'll tell you a place where we cared about it um, equally and we were able to meet with more success. Uh, you know, probably among the people who, who folks care about the least in the world, and those are incarcerated young black men at Rikers Island. And one of the cases that I'm most proud of that we did, both on the civil side and on the criminal side, was joining a lawsuit to um, strike back against unconstitutional treatment of young adolescents at Rikers Island. Rikers Island is, a, is a mostly a pre-detention facility in New York City, one of the worst places on earth. It's like, it's like the state of nature in that place. And with impunity, over periods of time, uh, correction officers who, who wield you know, literally absolute power over these, a lot of these kids were violating their rights, sometimes killing them by beating them to death and sometimes killing them by acts of omission and not giving them medicine uh, when they needed to get it. And we spent just as much time, worked just as hard um, round the clock to break that you know, code of silence among correction officers when it was required to be done as we did on any other case that had a high profile and it involved uh, you know, victims who had a lot of wherewithal and a lot, of, and a lot more support in the community. And then also, alongside it, another reason I'm proud of it, is we joined you know, the class action lawsuit brought against uh, the city and against the, co the commissioner and the, and the Department of Corrections so that not only were we holding individuals accountable, but also making sure that the system was changed. I mean, they didn't have cameras where they should have had cameras. People, you know, guards, were, you know, correction officers were getting away sometimes with these beatings because they knew where all the cameras were and they would just, they would drag an inmate to a place to retaliate where there was no camera. And so you know, it was, I had a great interest, to go back to your question, in making sure people knew we were fighting for those, and some of them got accused of crimes, and we're not you know, Boy Scouts, but to make people understand that you, know, you can be from that you know, part of life and the world, and we're still gonna care about you, and we're still gonna get uh, punishment against people who are much more powerful because that's how the system should be. So if you can, if you can make sure you, if you're uh, wealthy and powerful, you can be held to account, and if you're not considered powerful, you can still be vindicated in your rights, and you do that over and over and over again. Hopefully over time, people begin to develop some faith that there's only one system of justice. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much.
And once again, thank you to the Krieger family for making this possible. And please continue to check out uh, Preet's podcast for more. Thank you.